There we go. Welcome all. This is uh, Brett Russell with the uh, the co-chair of the uh, Hyperledger Media and Entertainment Special Interest Group. And today we have uh, Matt Zaracina, CEO and co-founder of True Tickets, uh, which is a, a company that is uh, revolutionizing the ticket industry and uh, using, in some cases, uh, blockchain applications, uh, the IBM uh, blockchain. I did have the... Uh, uh, I uh, have a look at uh, or listen to the interview with uh, you, Matt, and uh, Jerry Cuomo, um, and uh, that was really good. It was really, you know, I, I, I don't know Jerry. I've been to a few events, that, and I think I met him, but uh, we're not the uh, best of buddies. But uh, he's, a, he's a good uh, podcaster guy. I thought, uh, you know, he's a, he's a brilliant technician, but uh, uh, he's a, he was a good podcaster. And actually, I'll actually put the link up um in the uh i'll put the link up for anyone uh then that will be in the uh in the uh uh in the recording here so sorry just let me uh yeah i think i've i've known jerry now for gosh almost five years so I, I no think kidding he's, he's known about us since we started i mean we we incorporated as a company in september of 2017 i think we started engaging with him and the Hyperledger folks and the IBM folks. I want to say we kind of fall winter of 20, 2017 and then probably more so kind of spring, winter, spring of 2018. Well, he's a, I, I'm sure that he was, uh, he played some role in, uh, in helping you guys get uh, uh, pulled together the IBM side of the blockchain thing. And that's, that's a phenomenal uh, asset uh, in him. So tell us a little bit about you, about your team, about True Tickets, where you're going. And uh, you have the floor. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you. All right. I'll, uh, I'll share my screen because it's always easier to rely on a couple slides, right? So um, let me know if you can see it. It should be all right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Per perfectly. So, true Tickets, you know, what we really are, as it says there, right? We're a provider of trusted access for live experiences. And what that means in maybe a more technical sense is we're a B2B enterprise SaaS infrastructure solution for ticketing. We're, we're built to work with any ticketing system. We're built to work with any marketplace. And I'd say the best analogy for what we are trying to do and why it's unique is if anybody's familiar with airline ticketing, there's a company called Sabre, right? And, and Sabre is the underlying infrastructure that essentially facilitates the vast majority of airline ticketing, especially in the year in the US. And something like that doesn't exist in live event ticketing, right? Which is, you know, it, it, by not having this underlying infrastructure that creates transparency and efficiency, you get all sorts of issues. And that, that's essentially what we do. And that's essentially what we're trying to be and trying to solve for. So today I'll talk a little bit about our team. I'll talk about ticketing. I'll talk a little bit about blockchain and why fabric, but most of what I'll talk about is just on our business and the problem we're solving, right? So here's our here's our team. Uh, so True Tickets was co-founded by myself, uh, Steve, by, by me and, and my co-founder, Steve. Uh, Steve and I have known each other for about 20 years. Uh, we used to, we were both Navy pilots together. We met in flight school. Uh, we reconnected in January of 2017. Uh, I had just taken a corporate innovation job for a French aerospace defense company called Talus, where I was their director of innovation. I led their blockchain project. I led their autonomous vehicle project, did a couple other things. Uh, Steve was actually at the Pentagon working on blockchain at the Pentagon, and we connected. Uh, we had tried to do some things kind of in the aerospace and defense space, uh, but he, you, I'd say kind of spring, summer of 2017, had written a white paper on ticketing, and it reminded me of a conversation I had with a, an expert at MIT who's an advisor to our company. We had had a, a conversation in January at MIT on just blockchain and potential use cases. And it, for a minute, we kind of talked about ticketing and we thought that was a great use case. Uh, my CTO, Andrew, uh, he and I actually worked together at Talus. Um, and what makes Andrew unique is he has experience in building and delivering distributed systems. And then Ken, so my head of sales, uh, Ken has all, you know, over 30 years in ticketing. Uh, what makes Ken very unique though is there's 
really only been one other blockchain enabled ticketing company um, for all intents and purposes that that's had a lot of activity or I'd say you could say is the only one that's been acquired and that was upgraded. Uh, they're an Ethereum based firm. There were four individuals. Ken was the fourth. Um, the, the three more technical individuals went to Ticketmaster. Ken didn't want to go back to Ticketmaster. Uh, had an opportunity to join a couple of different other startups in the fall of 2018. Um, I was introduced to him by one of our investors and he decided to join us. So when you look across the board, I'd like to say from a just a, a business, a technology and an industry standpoint, we all have some level of experience with, with blockchain and ticketing and, and really trying to solve real world problems. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, you know, I my journey um, has been an interesting one. I started out as a, as a Navy pilot, and then I taught at Cornell for a bit. Uh, then I went to Deloitte, where I worked in their M&A practice, and then went to Talos, where I worked in corporate innovation. And, and really, my my focus in corporate innovation was on finding my next opportunity. So I, if you would have told me when I started that job at Talos, I'd be running a digital ticketing startup leveraging you know, blockchain and hyperledger fabric, I probably wouldn't have believed you. Um, but here I am almost five years later after leaving the job and this is what we're doing. And you know, if, you, if you're interested in my perspectives on ticketing, um, emerging tech and ticketing, whether it's NFTs, whether it's Web3, know that I have opinions. Um, and a lot of them are on Medium. So if you want to check them out on Medium, um, you know, some of the ones I've listed here are more of the some of the popular ones, or I'd say mo most read. So just what maybe the future of the industry would look like. You know, I'm, you know, my perspective is, is I'm not as big on NFTs as tickets as maybe other people, uh, namely because when you think of an NFT, it's a digital asset and a ticket is actually not an asset. It's a revocable license. And, and that's one of those foundational definitional differences that is actually pretty important. I'm going to talk a little bit about ticketing and, and Web 3.0 and, and what that could mean. So if you're interested in any of those opinions, uh, feel free to check those out. Uh, that's about my team. That's about me. So let's talk ticketing. Um, when you think about ticketing and the problems that need to be solved, it's always important to really understand the history, right? And maybe we think about ticketing today as like a fairly static industry, but it's actually it's actually quite dynamic. And the the world of ticketing has always struggled with this idea of of control and transparency with distribution, right? They want to get as many eyes or as many hands on tickets as possible to drive attendance. Um, control and transparency can mitigate that, right? So we go back to the 1970s, you know, the evolution there was just moving away from regional box offices. Again, tickets used to be sold, but the box office was the place to get the ticket. Tickets were in ticket racks, and that's how people bought tickets. And then in the 80s, you started to see computerized ticketing. And, and in many ways, like this was actually led by IBM, oddly enough, you know, big mainframes, they were, they were doing the ticketing. You start to see Ticketmaster is actually founded around this time. And then in the 90s, there's the big, there's the evolution to uh, the web, right? And Ken likes to say he was at Ticketmaster when they, they sold their first ticket on the web, right? And they were high-fiving and they thought, wow, this would be great if, you know, maybe one or two or 3% of our sales come through this new web channel. And obviously, um, you know, they underestimated that a little bit. As you move into the 2000s, you start to see, you know, this, you know with the rise of the web and marketplaces, obviously marketplaces and fan clubs. So new ways to distribute tickets, new ways to get reached, new ways to monetize, new revenue streams. This is where you see, you know, the stub hubs of the world to an extent like SeatGeek and Vivid Seats really, really start to emphasize, you know, and, and grow in the market. And in the 2010s, in the teens, it's really about mobile ticketing, right? So getting tickets on your phones. And as we look forward to the future, you know, what do, what do the 20s, 30s, and 40s look like? It's really this idea of, you know, does, does a distributed ledger technology or distributed system really start to add value to ticketing, right? Now, so now you've got kind of ticketing moving full digital and there's obviously still issues with ticketing, right? And, and when you think about the problem you're solving, it really helps to understand the life cycle, right? So I know this is a little bit hard to see uh, with the arrows, but all tickets start with a ticket issuer, right? So you've got this issuer, this live event venue that could be theater, sports, music, what have you. And their job is to disseminate the tickets, right? So that these tickets can access their IP which is the content they create. And what makes ticketing challenging, right, is those tickets actually can go through multiple channels to ultimately end up at the ticket buyer. So one, the live event venue, event venue can be selling directly to the ticket buyer. Think about, you know, when I grew up in Minneapolis, I went to First Ave. 
and I would buy tickets directly from First Ave and I would go. So that's the case of the ticket buyer directly, buying directly from the venue. Then there's these authorized sellers. So some venues will leverage marketplaces or other distribution channels in an authorized way to sell tickets, right? So maybe they have a deal with a channel and that channel then, um, you know, for example, like a gold star in the theater space could sell tickets on behalf of a venue, right? So this is an authorized seller. And then there's these resellers, right? Which could be brokers, scalpers, anyone who's flipping a ticket. You know, that's kind of that, that third one here. And, it, and there's now creates this matrix, right? Of your know, tickets getting to the ticket buyer. Maybe it goes from the venue to the authorized seller to the, to the, to the actual kind of buyer or attendee. And then it goes, or it goes authorized seller to broker to, to eventual kind of ticket buyer attendee. And this then kind of creates that problem, right? Because with every one of these transactions, and if you have uh, opacity in the system or a lack of efficiency, lack of transparency, you create issues, right? Those are where you get fees and th those are where you get people buying illegitimate or fraudulent tickets and that, those all create issues, right? So understanding the complexity and the complications of the life cycle and understanding the flow is critical in, in how you think about solving this problem. And if we take a step back and just think about in general, you know, when you're when you're trying to apply distributed ledger tech to a solution, understanding the business problem and why having a distributed data solution is potentially better than the other solutions out there is key. And like I said, you know, we, we focus a lot less on the tech and we focus more on the problem we're solving. So when it pertains to ticketing, what are the problems? Well, I mean, one is control, right? So the minute the minute kind of that ticket issuer sells that ticket and it leaves their hands, you know, they've lost the ability to to have control over, right? It means it can be duplicated, can be scalped, can be manipulated. The other one is identity. And I think this is kind of a shocking stat, right? Uh, the Boston Red Sox, or in this this by, by no means is pertains to like our clients, which are arts clients, but you know, I talked to, um, not this wasn't the Red Sox, I talked to another major league baseball team. They know 25% of the people who attend their stadium in a year. They draw too many people a year. That's 15, you know, 1.5 million people they don't know. Right. And, and that, that identity is a huge issue. And when we think about, you know, the attention economy, right, Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and Google and Facebook, uh, they know 90 to 99 percent of the consumers of their service. And if you're you know, a live event venue, you only know 25 to 40 percent of the people consuming your service. You're at a disadvantage because you can't market, you can't curate your content or you can't you can't really curate it as well or market it as well as those other, other organizations in the attention economy. The last one's integrity, right? So everyone, we've all been there. You know, we're, we're looking, we want to go to an event. It's a high profile event. We're buying a ticket. We're spending a lot of money and we're just kind of uneasy or we're queasy or nauseous that, oh man, maybe this ticket won't work, right? So you're always kind of concerned about it. So you know, these are the key problems in ticketing. And when you think about how you would solve it, I mean, it's obviously, you know, you want to make sure there's control, right? So making sure those tickets can't be duplicated or manipulated. You want to make sure there's there's identity, right? Event organizers should know who's coming to their actual shows. And, and the third is verifiability, right? So you want integrity of tickets. And, and this is really how we approach solving ticketing. Um, why blockchain? The, the why blockchain piece in ticketing is pretty simple. You can Google blockchain and ticketing, and I don't even know if true tickets will pop up as one of the top <laughs> searches. Um, and, and look, that's good, right? Like people are excited about this technology and what it can do. Um, at the highest, highest level, when you kind of go back to that square, right? Where you've got the live event venue, the, the, the primary sale by a third party, the resale, the ticket buyer. Ticketing is a distributed problem in that you have multiple external organizations or entities or people essentially handling the same inventory. So the thought that people like you know, us and people like me and companies like us envision exploring is, well, if it's a distributed problem, distributed problems are best solved by distributed solutions. Um, an analogy to use is, yeah, I used to fly the, the, the SA-60 Bravo, right? So it was, a, it was a Black Hawk, but it was retrofitted to, to hunt submarines. But anybody who knows if you're in kind of the warfare community, the best way to hunt something is to be in the median. Right. So we were always at a disadvantage. The best way to hunt an enemy submarine is with another submarine, someone that's in the medium. Right. Same thing with aircraft. Like the best way to fight an aircraft is usually with another aircraft. Um, and so in this instance, when you when you think about it, like a distributed technology should theoretically be able to solve a distributed problem. That's why people get excited about blockchain. Right. And we all know what the issues are. We talked about, um, you know, uh, attendance. We talked about knowledge. Um, the other thing, too, is really interesting is is 
understanding that tickets again are not assets they're revocable licenses and so when you were if you had a cardstock ticket back in the day it was you know, there was all this verbiage and fine print on the back and you never really read it well those are the terms and conditions to fulfill that license right so it's not an asset it's not a thing like you that you own like a house or a car and so there can be different licensing restrictions and teams and leagues and venues want to enforce those restrictions and for the most part it was really challenging to enforce them but now as, as ticketing moves digital, it becomes much, much easier to enforce some of those restrictions and you can automate that and, and it makes it a lot easier. The other thing too, is when you think about it from a business standpoint, there's a ton of money kind of left on the table via rent seeking behavior, right? So when you think of value of partnerships, if, if I'm a ticket issuer, if I'm, if I'm major league baseball, or if I'm the NFL and I had, you know, major league baseball does 70 million tickets a year. Uh, if I want to strike a deal with a marketplace and make them my exclusive marketplace to have maximum value, I, I need to make sure I, I can ensure there's minimum leakage, right? And so today there's a lot of leakage. So the value of their partnerships goes down. If, if I can have a technology um, that allows me to control the channels my tickets are, are accessed via, as well as who my channel partners are and the controls around them, I actually increase the value of those partnerships, right? So it means that I can drive more revenue to my organization because there's less leakage. And so that, again, that's why this whole kind of chain of custody, right? You bring identity, you bring accountability to ticketing, and you go from a situation where the live event venue is not the data owner, right? To where, to one where they are, or at least they're, they're, they have visibility into all the data real time. And that's a game changer, right? So that, that changes everything. And I was actually having a conversation um, with an NBA team owner yesterday, and we were talking about the relationship they have with their major ticketing system, which everybody knows, but for them, the, the, the value proposition or the, 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 the equation they're trying to balance is my, you know, I trade my data, they give me cash up front, right? Well, the only way to really change that because they can't really impact the cash. Cause you know, if I'm, if I'm said basketball team and your ticketing system is writing me a $2 million check to kind of get my tickets and get my data, obviously the ticketing system believes the, the, the value of those tickets and the data is worth more than $2 million. And so if you can do things as, as, a, as a team, as a league, as a ticket issuer to drive up the value either of that, that inventory or that data, right? So when you have blockchain, you get not only more data, but you get more consistent, more standard, uh, more accurate data. That actually means the value of that data goes up, which means if you want to make a cash trade, you, you can drive up more value, right? So it's all about, it's all about creating value for the issuer of the ticket. So why fabric, right? I mean, there's, there's a ton of people doing tokens and ticketing and you know, ICOs and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, our learning is that really that ticketing is a B2B enterprise business challenge, right? Um, and why to an extent you probably haven't seen as many uh, ticketing systems proliferate or proliferate more broadly in the space is because some of these unique technical requirements that are really minimums for ticketing. And the first one is, is transaction processing speed. There's really not a world where you can effectively implement a ticketing, a distributed ledger or blockchain ticketing solution at scale that can't process more than 1500 transactions per second, or at least a minimum, right? And, and that has to do with on sales. And most of the websites for the vast majority of websites and ticketing allow for up to 1500 transactions per second. And that that's for that, peak volume, right? That's a, uh, you know, playoff game goes on sale. Taylor Swift tickets go on sale. There's a spike and you need to be able to handle that traffic. Um, if you can't meet that minimum, it's, it's pretty challenging to, to sell yourself as a solution to anyone in, in the marketplace. The second one is latency. You know, one of the things again, with, sorry, and on transactions per second, you can architect fabric in a way to, to give you several thousand transactions per second. And again, it's because it's enterprise to enterprise, right? You probably only have a handful of nodes or participants in your broader system. You're not dealing with thousands upon thousands of, of nodes and systems, right? I mean, if you think about the US, there's essentially five major major ticketing systems, right? There's Ticketmaster, there's Tickets.com, SeatGeek, um, Access, and then Tessitura, you know, that's in sports, right? Or sorry, um, Tessitura is not in sports, but there's only a, kind of a half dozen or so ticketing systems. And then when you think marketplaces, again, it's about a half dozen. You've got StubHub, Seeky, TM Plus, Vivid Seats, you know, TickPick, GameTime. There's not thousands, right? And even though ticketing feels like a peer-to-peer -peer transaction, it's really not. You need that marketplace to list that ticket. And without that marketplace, it makes it really hard to find buyers, right? So there's always this kind of 
push and pull between, you know, is it really peer to peer or is it B2B? We see it as B2B. Um, and so you know, what Fabric does really well is, is handle the, the transaction problem. Second one is latency. Um, how quickly you kind of you know, flow through those transactions. And in ticketing, again, this needs to be near milliseconds. And if you have, you know, if your if your latency, uh, some of the faster ones on the the more tokenized platforms are five seconds. I think I think Algorand is getting to two and a half seconds. Um, that's still not fast enough. In that, think about if you've got, I mean, we've got a client, Boston Symphony. They do outdoor concerts at Tanglewood. They're doing 15,000, 20,000 people. They've got four gates. <laughs> I mean, it, even at two and a half seconds per kind of uh, you know transaction processing. Uh, transaction being processed is just not fast enough, right? So you need to be able to go fast. And that, that's one of the things that Fabric, Fabric allows for it is very well. And the third one is finality. Um, anything where you're waiting, where there's a confirmation or a wait time, um, again, that is any measurable length of time is a challenge in ticketing. Take, you know, not that you would use a, a, a proof of work solution, but like Bitcoin, right? It's, it's proof of work, finality, confirmation is an hour. Um, what happens if after an hour someone scans a ticket and then you, you find out that that transaction was invalid, they shouldn't have been in there. You go pull them out of the seat. Um, you know, and so in thinking through and understanding your business use case really drives, starts to drive your, your, your protocol constraints. And there's actually not many protocols that can handle the, the technical requirements of ticketing. And the last one is, 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 is interesting to ticketing too. If you, if you look at at Fabric, what it does really well is it's optimal for handling or for handling op, it's optimal for handling generalized data and data objects. That's important because when you look at the vast majority of systems and marketplaces out there, a ticket is a data object, and essentially generalized data. It's not a token. And, and if you're going to be something that plugs into other systems to make them more efficient, you really need to be, be able to, to, to align with their data architecture, data model, and data mapping. And if you're going to tokenize, that just makes things harder. Now, if you are a believer that there are new marketplaces, new systems that are going to completely replace the existing systems and infrastructure, then you, you, you may think differently than I do on this one. That said, what people, I think, like me, when I initially got in this, failed to comprehend is actually how much these other ticketing systems do, right? Whether it's payment rails, whether it's uh, you know, seat, seat mapping, seat configuration, um, management of constituents. I mean, the, these systems are, are so big that and do so much, it's really hard to, to argue that anyone would make this massive change. And you have to couple that with two. And ticketing, while ticketing may seem benign, ticketing is a mission critical system for every live experience creator, right? Whether it's the Celtics or the Patriots or the Symphony, if ticketing doesn't work on one night, it's a disaster. And so they need to go with proven technology. They need to go with things that work. And so you know, this is one of the reasons why this ticketing, while, while people get excited about distributed ledger tech and ticketing, why maybe it's been a little bit slower to permeate is because these systems are complex. They do a lot. And it is a big effort to shift for any one of these venues. And the other thing too is if they're shifting, I mean, again, the technology just has to be as rock solid as possible. And this is why you see a little bit more probably conservatism in, in the approach or in digital transformation that you see from you know, live event venues. You know, now that said, one thing that one benefit of COVID was you saw a lot more digital transformation or openness to doing things digitally. You know, that said, they're still, you know, they still need to make sure that the ticketing works well. And, and one of the benefits for True Tickets is that you know, we've built a pretty robust solution that our, our clients feel comfortable using and, and have been using it at scale. Uh, so our solution, our approach again, software is a solution to a problem. We're not trying to fit a technology. We're trying to be very smart about how we solve problems for our customers. Um, you know, the problems in ticketing, we talked about them a little bit. Uh, you, you know, tickets as duplicable assets. So you, you've got kind of one paper ticket, you can make a hundred copies and then that's a race condition. Um, ticketing systems do lag behind other industries and they lag behind because again, they're these big, large, complex solutions. Some of them having, you know, code that goes back decades, right, to the 70s. Even the newest code bases go back 90s, early 2000s. And so you're talking, at best, the, you, most of them are probably 20-year-old code bases. So they're, they're suboptimal, but they work. 
right? And, and they've been built on top of, so it makes it very challenging um, for, for them to evolve. You know, they're kind of more battleships, right? They're not as nimble, even though, you know, if you download an app, it may look and feel digital because uh, it is, um, but, you know, don't assume that the technology under it is, is you know, cloud native, the most efficient um, and, and the most, you know, uh, optimal for, for um, the solution. And then again, we talked about it, ticketing is a distributed problem, right? So you've got multiple entities essentially handling the same data. And as we think about the ticket lifecycle, what we think we can do is listed on the right, right? So it's, we can provide the event, you know, uh, the live event um, venue, you know, information regarding who the attendee is, or at least one degree of separation. Uh, we can provide them controls. We can provide them potential remuneration opportunities. Um, and obviously the, the, the direct connection, right? When you're the live event venue, you want to have that direct relationship, that direct connection with the people who are consuming your service. Those are the people who, for whatever reason, maybe you didn't know them right away, but then they're, they're coming in your door. Well, you want to make sure you connect with them throughout because that's how you can minimize uh, any sort of arbitrage or, or revenue loss throughout the life cycle. And there's two ways to think about it. So we, we uh, had a, a major announcement yesterday. So we announced the release of, of rules-based ticket sharing. Um, you know, Brett, you talked about it. I did a podcast with Jared Cuomo last week. I actually did one with Dave Wakeman, who's a, a, a ticketing consultant, ticketing expert, and that was released yesterday. So we talked a little bit more about it. But it's this idea to start the initial rules that our venue clients can implement around tickets are, you know, does the original purchaser of the ticket have to go, right? So let's say Brett buy, buys four tickets. If those tickets can be shared, but the original purchaser has to go, he can only share three of the four. Uh, this, the, other one, the two other rules are one, can a ticket be shared, right? So Brett buys four tickets, can those tickets be shared or not? And the third is, can they be reshared? So if, if Brett shares a ticket with me, um, it either sits with me and can't go anywhere other than back to Brett, or if it can be reshared, I could, I could share with Encore and then it could go on and on and on. And that's what we announced yesterday. It's, uh, we're, we're pretty pleased with it. And, and the, the reason we're pleased with it is not because that is the end all be all, it's really about what it portends for the future, right? Which is this idea of controllable resale, right? So if I can, if I can put rules or if I can implement and enforce rules around the sharing of a ticket, I could theoretically do the same for resale, right? So what channels are those tickets going on, right? So if I'm Boston Symphony, do I want to allow SeatGeek to set, allow my tickets to be listed on SeatGeek or not? Or TM Plus, maybe, maybe not. Do I want to strike a deal there? What are the rules around the resale of those tickets, right? So if, it's really changing ownership, right? So Brett's reselling tickets. What are the rules around the, the transfer of that ownership? So if I buy that ticket, what needs to happen, right? This could be um, price floors, price ceilings. This could be, you know, all sorts of other issues. And then there's the third is kind of the, the remuneration scheme, right? So if it's sold above face value, does half of that markup go back to the symphony as a donation, right? So the, the world of possibilities when you, when you think about um, rules-based resale or, or creating rules-based marketplace infrastructure is really appealing because for if I'm Boston Symphony, there's no way I can compete with the search, search engine optimization of a Vivid Seats or a SeatGeek or a TM Plus. But what I can do, what I'd like to do is be able to have a technology that let me, lets me take advantage of their reach without sacrificing control. So that's really what we're exploring now. Uh, you know, this is our operational snapshot. Um, I got to update that. We're actually live with 10 venues now. So we'll be announcing a new one next week. Um, we've delivered almost 2 million tickets. I'd say about a third of those are enabled by Hyperledger Fabric on blockchain. And so we offer both a, a blockchain and a non-blockchain service. Uh, some of our clients have no desire to take advantage of secondary markets or other distribution channels. And in that case, that's a completely centralized uh, solution. There's no reason to distribute the data. So we, we built out a, a, a non-blockchain solution that is, is more cost-effective. Uh, the market value of our tickets is over the last kind of two years has been about 120 million dollars and of those two million tickets we scanned uh, about one and a quarter um, so i like to say that that we're a pretty proven pretty proven opportunity and and we're hoping to kind of keep this going and, and build out the marketplace infrastructure and so with that there's kind of a little bit of a rambling talk but i'll i'll stop there i think we got like 25 minutes bro happy to entertain any questions y'all have that was uh, pretty awesome, Matt. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'll throw it out to the floor, but uh, um, the, I, I like this uh, rules base, and I do recall you talking to uh, Jerry about that, but uh, that's exciting stuff. And I, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, my wife uh, 
uh, purchasing uh, the latest Bruce Springsteen event, uh, and it was a <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, that was a disaster. Oh man, talk about clunky. Uh, you know, it it it. Uh, I mean, this is one of the things that they're solving with this uh, this new venue or this new method of ticket purchasing through Ticketmaster, and I don't know how they did it, but uh, my wife was in a tizzy for for some time looking at uh, waiting to get online and being told she had a, she was in a queue and waiting and like it was crazy what uh, what are your thoughts on that and of course uh, Brucey's in the news about how how much these tickets are being sold for most of it is to stop the bots and uh, some of it is to stop the piracy and are you solving most of that with the, this new rules based side of things so we do it in a different way right so Unlike Ticketmaster and unlike most people in the ticketing space, we don't sell tickets. We deliver tickets. Right. And as a as a trans transparency, identity, and accountability solution, it's it's really independent on what happens on the front end, right? So we um, there was an announcement a couple of weeks ago. We announced our partnership with the Smith Center in Hamilton for their on sale. And the way Hamilton approaches on sales is a little bit different. They they just kind of let the sale happen, and they take actually two to four weeks then to sort through. They don't release the tickets, so when you when you buy a ticket, you get an email saying, "Hey, you get a confirmation that you know your tickets will be delivered." But then they actually go through the data to see, all right, is do we think this person's a bot? Uh, do we think they're a real you know a real person who's going to go to the show? You know, do we are we able to connect them with any sort of secondary market activity? So there, there's different ways to solve it, and what's interesting about us is is we're simply an enforcement mechanism, right? So from sale to scan. We're an enforcer of the ticket, and that can be that can be you know if people want to not have their tickets show up on the secondary market, but could also be to work with the secondary market. Again, you know, people, our clients can put rules around tickets. We let them put the rules around the tickets um, that's in the best interest for their business. But other than that, we just enforce it. And so I would say that that that's a big difference for us. So I actually kind of in, in understanding ticketing, completely removed ourselves from that front end mess. Right. So we're just a, a delivery mechanism, delivery option. So in that way, you know, we allow our clients to handle the bot problem, but in a different way. Right. You could try to you could try to handle the bot problem head on at the on sale, which is tough. It's just it's tough because, you, I mean, there's just so many things going on or you can let things happen and then you can start to kind of weed through and kick out, you know, what you think are, 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 are bad purchases or bad sales. Um, and again, it, it's more of a business decision. So on the, like I said, we don't, we don't sell tickets. And I think that's actually a benefit for us because one of the things too is you know, we want to be an infrastructure play that, that works with every system and every marketplace. And one of the ways, really the only way to do that is to simply be a delivery mechanism and say, you're not a sales mechanism, because if I start selling tickets, then I'm actually competitive with a ticketing system or marketplace versus if I'm just delivering tickets, you know, I can actually be an infrastructure play that helps everybody. Tell me, um, there's a lot of uh, big names uh, promoting crypto in, the, in, in many venues. Um, maybe they're not so proud of it lately with the crypto winter being what it is, but uh, any thoughts about uh, integrating uh, crypto payments in, or yeah, have you been approached by any of your clients about uh, the potential for having either stable coins being used or things of that nature? As part of the blockchain side of your uh, of your uh, integrations, we've we've had conversations, and and I, I tutor a course for Oxford University on blockchain, where we, it's not just ticketing; it's it's broadly, and and again, I actually tell my clients like separate us. Again, we're a delivery mechanism. So when you, Brad, if you go to you know the Adrian R Center in Miami, you buy a ticket, you go to their website, you select their ticket like you always did, you pay for it. With your credit card or however whatever their payment rail is and then when you get to the end you know they're saying they'll either tell you hey your ticket's going to be delivered digitally or you get to select and if you select digital it's delivered through us and the conversations i have with most of my clients around should we do crypto is completely independent of true tickets because we're not a crypto platform usually what i do is i ask them okay well why why do you, why from a business standpoint does it make sense for you to accept crypto so is it you're trying to maybe engage a new demographic? Do you see this as being some sort of, you know, currency hedge? Uh, 
so, so typically it, it's completely separate. So I get asked about it, but I would say, look, I, for them, I say crypto is just another payment mechanism potentially for you, right? So it's, oh, I'm checking out, do I buy it in, you know, USDT or do I buy it with my Visa card, right? And, and again, completely independent of true tickets because we're after that. And so I would say that from the crypto standpoint, are our clients looking at it and interested in it? Yes. Have we talked to them about it? Yes. Is there any, any impact today for true tickets? I would say no. Most, like I said, most of my client conversations around, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, why are you doing crypto? Why are you doing NFTs? Like, what from a, what business problem are you attempting to solve? Or what, what business hypothesis are you trying to prove out? That's the more important thing. And if you think that crypto is part of it, then you should absolutely explore it. But for us, we're, we're completely independent of, of any of that. Excellent. What um, from the uh, the uh, participants here? Does anyone have any questions for uh, Matt? If you do, uh, open up your microphone and uh, and go ahead. Hi, this is uh, Ankur here. Uh, great. Hi, great presentation. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what is the kind of business impact, uh, uh, some feedback around business impact that you would have got? For example, uh, using your uh, uh, technology, uh, was there an increase in revenue because people were able to do secondary sales or ticket distribution got better because they were able to reach people, because they were able to identify them better? Uh, how does it lead to some business impact? So I, the, the business impact today is, is about identity and accountability, right? So if you think on the ticketing side, I mean, now that we've been in operations for two years, we have some quantifiable data around the impact, right? So we're seeing one is like a lower no-show rate, right? So people who are using our tickets relative to other ticket types they are showing they're showing up at the venue in higher propensity than others right um this could be for several reasons it could be that maybe brokers and scalpers are avoiding our tickets right so the, the people who are most likely to eat tickets or not go are likely those who are trying to find some sort of arbitrage um the second is because of the way our ticketing solution is constructed it really is a, a live event management solution as well right so you you're not downloading an app it's a web app um, you're able to access it and our clients are able to change things about the ticket and the event essentially real time. Uh, so for example, there was a show a couple, a year and a half ago in Orlando, they had that, they had an outdoor festival because um, they're still dealing, dealing with COVID and a thunderstorm rolled through right at seven o'clock and the show was supposed to start at 7 p.m. And at first they were, they had just implemented with us and they, they were really concerned, oh, we got to do radio announcements, we got to do email blasts, we got to do phone calls telling everyone the show's you know, delayed by 30 minutes when they kind of stopped and said, actually, we just need to update the system and the ticket will take care of it, right? So creating that real, that real-time connection with the actual person, it has an impact, right? So if you're notifying people, they're more likely to come. Uh, and and that, that's, that's had a huge factor. The other thing too is, is the, the ticket buyers lately post COVID are, are really buying last minute. And so the ones that are buying last minute are more likely to go. Um, and, and that's having an effect, right? The other thing too is from a, a management standpoint on the operation side, um, what we're finding is a lot of customer service throughout time was dealt, used dealing with ticketing issues. And with our service, we're seeing a significant drop in ticketing issues, right? Uh, there's a lot less fraud, there's a lot less confusion. If somebody says, hey, I had a ticket, it's pretty, takes minutes, right? To just kind of get to the bottom of it. And so you're seeing you know, box office staffs, having me you know, being much lower uh we went to it was last year i went to the public theater the the week we launched with them and uh, my my head of sales and a couple other people associated with true tickets we went to one of their shows and i was asking my client i said look i'm kind of curious what is the impact of true tickets as you see it today on on how you kind of ticket and how you get people into the venue and he said look at the box office and i said yeah he's like what do you see i go nobody it was exactly there's nobody at the box office Right. Usually we have lines with people like having problems with ticketing. We have no lines, which means I can I can move my CSRs around. And the other big one is fraud, right? Fraud and secondary market. I mean, we're seeing like a 90 to 95 percent reduction 
in chargebacks, which is the fee that that venues get if there's a fraud issue, they they typically venues you know end up paying paying tens of thousands of dollars a year in, in chargebacks. And so you start to see the quantifiable business impact. Right now, when it comes to distributed ledger tech, the thought is in the future, and this is what we're exploring now, is, is how do we incorporate distribution channels that want to be a part of it, right? So there's the revenue upside of it. But you know, we are seeing a significant impact. And, and for anyone who's building a business leveraging this tech, I think you know it's easy to get enamored with the tech but it's still kind of just business value proposition 101, right? Like how can I, what does it cost? And, and like, what's the gain? What's the ROI, right? And so we're seeing significant ROI and, and really that's what we rely on when we talk about our service and the benefits to our clients is you know, here's the impact we're seeing with other clients and here's what this could mean for you independent of the technology. Understood. Uh, uh, thanks, Matt. That was a fairly comprehensive answer. Uh, I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, uh, what kind of customer behavior change um, you are apprehensive of uh, because you are using a new tech was there some behavior change that you were expecting on the part of the customer? You would have some hypothesis uh, and have those hypotheses paid out. So in ticketing, it's it's important to distinguish the how who I define as a client or a customer and a consumer, right? So in ticketing, the consumer is the person using the ticket, but they're actually not the client. So there's probably yeah, two, I, two I, parties. I think, yeah. yeah, sorry. So I think I should have clarified. I mean the end consumer. Got it. So you're talking from like the venue side? Um, I buy the ticket to a show. Oh, got it, got it, got it. So on the consumer side. Yep. So one of the things we've done is with our solution is actually done hundreds of hours of user testing. Um, with demographics that align with our clients. And what we have found, our clients, one of our clients' biggest concerns is uh, adoption, right? Saying, hey, we've got a demographic that maybe isn't as technologically savvy. Uh, we need to be mindful of that. It's going to be hard to adopt. And really what, what we've done with our solution and, and what I think we did smartly even with our blockchain solution is if you interacted with it, you had no idea that there was distributed ledger tech underneath it. It was simply, you just interacted with the ticket. You accessed it, there were rules around it, you could do things with it. And in many ways, what that resulted in was we built a consumer facing uh, capability that essentially meets people where they're at, right? So think about it, I mean, we all, we do everything on our phones today, right? Um, and by the way, that's no different if you're 20, 40, 50, 80, right? Like my mom uses Uber, my dad uses Uber. Um, so what, what we like to joke about is the airline industry really kind of did all the heavy lifting to get people on their phones when it comes to ticketing. And so in many ways on the consumer side, the patron side, when you're buying a ticket, we're just meeting you where you're at already, right? So you're, you're going to your website, that part, nothing really has changed. The only thing that maybe has changed is how you're getting your ticket. So instead of getting a PDF printed home or something mailed to you or picking up a will call, you're getting an email at the link. You click that link and you're logging in with your venue credentials, right? So there's no true tickets is really the intel inside. And it, you know, if you go to any of our clients, they're just delivering through a white label site. I mean, Boston Symphony, it's I think tickets.tanglewood.org today. And you're logging in with their credentials. So for from a consumer standpoint, it's really fairly straightforward and seamless. Um, that said, it it's gonna look that way because we spent hundreds of hours trying to figure out what's the what's the most efficient way to do this? And what's, you know, what's gonna resonate? What's the verbiage, what's the flow? Uh, so we spent a lot of time user testing to understand how can we make sure that our, our service is intuitive. In fact, you know, with, with ticket sharing, what's been incredibly validating is we are, we're live with it now in pretty much all our venues. None of our venues have publicly communicated to their patrons that this feature is available. Yet in the last two weeks, we've seen thousands of tickets be shared thousands of new accounts being created and the the vast majority of the feedback we've gotten from our clients and their patrons has been oh wow this is great this is easy and so to me that's validation that all that work we did in trying to understand how to make the process as straightforward and seamless and intuitive possible is working because the organic usage of the service is literally requiring no education in that people just see a share button they click it they go through it and done they share the tickets and it's done. And when you're thinking about 
you know, I think one of the things in the blockchain and in crypto space that's challenging is I don't think it has an adoption problem. I think it has a user experience problem, right? Like if I want to get crypto, I've got to get a MetaMask and I've got to, you know, convert. I mean, shoot, one of the big, one of the big new changes is MetaMask now accepts credit cards, right? So I don't have to go to Coinbase. I don't have to buy on Coinbase and then convert my Ethereum to my, you know, transfer it to my MetaMask account to then buy other crypto. I can literally buy straight via my credit card on MetaMask. I'd much rather do that, right? Those are, that's a user experience. Problem. That has nothing to do with the tech, right? So when you're thinking about the solution you're building and, and where I think the builders in the blockchain and the crypto space have struggled is I think they, they have underestimated you know, the, the value of making something easy and intuitive and seamless for people. And a lot of times you hear people go, well, yeah, you're, you know, this is a little bit harder, but you get so much more benefit here. And that, that's just not how people work, right? Like people go, well, I want the benefit, but I also want this to be easy, right? And so if you, if you can't figure out how to, they, how to make that work, like you, you, your solution is not going to get adopted. It, an interesting analogy is think about air, airline Wi-Fi, right? Like 15 years ago, you just got on a plane and you accepted you weren't going to have internet, right? So maybe you loaded up your Outlook box, maybe you did something, you watched a movie, but then airline Wi-Fi came on. Now you can connect. Now you have email. And so now your, your expectation is I'm going to be able to get work done on my flight. And what happens when the air, you know, the in-flight Wi-Fi doesn't work? You're pissed because your expectation is not met, right? You, and then you want compensation. Like I should get more miles. Like I wasn't able to get my work done. Same thing when you're building even an emerging tech solution, you need to understand what the, what the, what the critical dimensions of the customer experience or the user experience are and what their minimum expectations are. And across the board, you at least have to meet the minimum. Otherwise, it's not going to get adopted. And this is where, again, I think in this space, because the technology is complex, right? Like, look, building distributed systems is hard. And in any one of those areas where the dimension is hard, if you're trying to get adoption, if you can't meet the minimum expectation, it, it's going to, you're going to struggle. And so one of the things that we've done very well is really architect our solution to be as seamless and intuitive as possible, where you can leverage the emerging tech, but from the consumer side, you know, it, it's essentially immaterial. You're either getting what you expected or better than what you expected. Got it. Thank you so much. Great questions, uh, Anchor. Thank you very much for that participation. Uh, any other questions from anybody? Uh, hi, this is Ramesh. Uh, so what exactly the difference between uh, uh, Selling the tickets versus delivering the tickets. So selling versus delivering, right? So uh, think about it like this: um, Ticketmaster sells the ticket, right? So you, they're the they're the payment rail. If I'm if I'm delivering the ticket, I'm maybe you think about it like this: it's a package. You go onto Amazon and you buy a package, but you know, that package can be delivered sometimes to the U.S. Postal Service, right? The U.S. Postal Service isn't selling you the package from Amazon. They're just making sure that package gets delivered, right? So it's more of an infrastructure play, right? So that's the biggest thing. And when you're selling a ticket, there's a, a, a little bit of a moral hazard if you want to be an infrastructure play because you're essentially monetizing and incentivized on, on making sure you sell those tickets for as much as possible versus being a delivery mechanism only, we can be an infrastructure solution. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Good question. Anybody else have a question for Matt? Yeah. Uh, hey, Matt. Uh, this is Arvind here. Uh, hey. One question about uh, the platform. You know, I'm just joined a little late into this call. So can I understand, like, from the infrastructure point of, like, what type of hyperledger platform is used for this complete uh, application, ticketing application? So, you know, I won't get too much into the tech, but we like to say we're, we're, we're built on Hyperledger Fabric. We run, we run on IBM blockchain and we deploy to Google Cloud. Okay, good enough. Thank you. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, I got to be, I got to be careful, right? Thank you, Venkat. Any other questions for Matt? You know, Brett, another way to kind of add to Ramesh's question, right? So when we think about the internet, you know, there's the application layer, right? And that, that's where you know, Amazon and a lot of other companies monetize. And there's the infrastructure layer, which is TCP IP, right? So 
the infrastructure layer delivers, doesn't sell. And so when you think about true tickets, our goal is to be that infrastructure layer that facilitates essentially effective and transparent and efficient ticketing. The application layers let ticketing systems and others sell tickets and we can just process. So we, we really want to be the pipes. And if you can be the infrastructure, you can do it for, for all systems and all marketplaces. The minute you start to be like a consumer facing application, you start to create challenges if you want to you know, be that infrastructure play. Makes sense. The, uh, the I think the whole concept of blockchain and uh, as, as you alluded to earlier is that it's invisible. It's uh, to the end user and they they're they're never going to know whether there's any blockchain in the back end and they shouldn't. And in some cases they shouldn't be told either. I think because of uh, the opinions that they may uh, they may come up with. But uh, well, hey, no, it, nobody advertises themselves as like a relational database company or that's right, company, exactly, right? yeah, exactly, yeah. distributed ledger. Uh, um, any other questions for Matt? We're uh, we're closing in on the one hour period here, and uh, Matt, that was a phenomenal presentation, and uh, we want to. Uh, uh, Hyperledger wants to thank you. I want to thank you very much for taking the time for putting all that together. And uh, we uh, definitely uh, have learned something today and a better appreciation for what you're doing. So oh, thank awesome, you. Brett. Thanks for reaching out and happy to do it. Thank you so much. And we'll, uh, we'll uh, make sure this gets up. I'll send you a link to the recording on the YouTube channel for everybody. Also in the uh, chat, I put a link to Matt's uh, opining on uh, NFTs and tickets. So that's uh, that's something we'll put those links up in the uh, in the uh, YouTube uh, video, uh, the Hyperledger, Hyperledger channel. So thank you all for attending, Matt. Thank you very much for taking the time again. And uh, it was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.